very much, Francesca, and good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to this um, More Exchange Forum event uh, as we come to the end of the project. Um, my name is Peter Jones, and I'm based in the Centre for Transport Studies at UCL in London, um, and I'm the scientific coordinator for the project. The, the theme for uh, this morning's session is bringing life back to streets, um, and a lot of more is focused on actually reallocating street space, but this is looking more broadly at the streets themselves. What are they for? What do they do? And particularly looking at busy urban streets, what in the UK we would call high streets or other people maybe call mixed use streets. We know they've suffered a lot with COVID um, and which has accelerated changes in, um, in trends to do with e-shopping and so on. But we also know that in many cases, it's been the high street that's been the lifeline for people uh, during lockdown when they couldn't travel long distances and so on. So we want to do here is to take a broader look at the high street, um, how it functions now and, and how it's going to move forward in the future. So um, I'll do some introductions in a moment, then, then I'll give an overview about some work uh, that we were involved in a few years ago, trying to get beneath the skin of the high street, see how they operate, what goes on there and so on. Um, and then uh, we'll hear from uh, Jane De Bono uh, and her colleague, uh, Gabriella Abadi, uh, who've been working as part of Camden Future High Street's team and have been doing some work looking at envisaging how to prepare high streets for the future, really. Uh, and then Pedro Homan de Guevara, who's, um, who's now at Polis, who used to be a senior advisor to the mayor in the city of Lisbon has worked very much looking at public realm and regenerating public spaces and so on. Um, and then we'll have a QA and a on, on those presentations um, and then we'll look to the future and I'll give a brief introduction and then I'll hand over to my colleague Miha Shukla from UCL who's been looking at the, the changing nature of high streets and the growth in digitization and connectivity and how that is likely to affect um, the way the high streets operate, and particularly their vulnerabilities and issues around cyber security and so on. So that's a quick run through. So um, welcome everybody. And I'll just do the inevitable, try and share my screen, screen and give you a sort of introduction to the issue about streets and how they operate. So I think it's probably fair to say that, that urban streets are our most challenging environment in terms of the pressures that are on the streets and the, the range of competing demands that are on those streets. And as we've investigated within more, these streets combine an important movement function, i.e. they're part of urban networks for a variety of modes of transport, but also important place functions as destinations in their own right. And what we need to do in these busy streets is accommodate both of those and accept that they need to be traded off in various ways. And of course, pressures have intensified on the, uh, on the modal side, the movement side. We have uh, electric bikes, e-scooters, and, and looking further ahead, AVs and things, autonomous vehicles and things like that. Uh, and on the place side, if you like, the actual streets as destination, then there are issues around new retailing patterns, the decline of the high street exacerbated by COVID, but also the reinvention of the high street. Um, and so first of all, I'm going to say a little bit about what we know now about how busy high streets or mixed use streets operate. When we talk about busy urban streets, we're really talking, if we use this threefold um, TFL classification of family street types, which have three levels of movement from local up strategic by all modes of transport, then three levels of place from local place significance to uh, national international place significance. And it's really those top four um, categories that we're looking at, the, the bottom left one being the high street, which is what we'll mainly uh, be focusing on today. The other element we, we've taken to heart within more is the idea of looking at the street as an ecosystem. So recognizing that um, there are various components, but also that these components interact and to some extent are interdependent. So for example, we're focused uh, on the movement and street activity, but obviously the buildings either side support and also supported by what happens on the street. And that's what we'll be looking at that wider context today. 
And then beneath the street, we have street utilities, we have underground services and so on, which again, at times will, just, will support the shops and things, uh, other activities on the streets, but also at times can cause disruption if there are uh, water burst pipes and so on. And then above the street, we have the airspace, which um, at the moment is mainly relevant in terms of things like GPS and uh, Wi-Fi, but in the future, may well, we may well see a number of drones carrying passengers or freight, and that may have impacts on, on what happens on the ground. So that's the sort of that side of it, but also there's an important temporal side of it as well. Uh, and here's one example as it happens from Camden High Street, looking uh, almost minute by minute at the intensity of demand for activities at the curbside, parking, loading, dropping off, picking up and waiting. And we can see not only is a great diversity of infrastructure there and a great diversity of activities, but the intensity of those activities vary very much during the day and also uh, from day to day. So what are the components of these busy streets? Well, in terms of movement, they provide links within wider networks, but also and often not fully recognised as their, their points of interchange, particularly public transport interchange. And I'll say more about that a bit later on. On the place side, obviously, the various buildings providing various sorts of services from selling goods to hairdressing, uh, solicitors, etc. So all the activity within the buildings adjacent to the street. And then the footway activities as well, ranging from economic activities, street stalls and things like that, information services through to social activities. And then broadly speaking, we can see our streets as very important public spaces. TfL often say that, that our streets represent 80% of London's public spaces, and therefore they're most the places where most social interaction arises. And finally, along our streets, there are key landmarks. They might be churches, they might be fountains, uh, other particular historic buildings or whatever. And these often have a real importance, symbolic importance in giving people um, not only a way of navigating around an area, but also a sense of local identity. And I'm briefly going to talk um, about a study we did a few years ago for Joseph Rowntree Foundation called Mixed Use Streets, um, where we looked at three sites, Tooting in southwest London, Ball Hill, to the east of the centre of Coventry, and London Road to the south of Sheffield. I'll mainly concentrate on Tooting, but also bring up some results from the other places as well. So this, these are some pictures, the, the main junction uh, at Tooting Broadway, uh, and then looking up the, the high street with the variety of traffic and people taking part in various activities. And this is a snapshot, you can see it's a few years old because it has walls, but this is a snapshot of the wide range of activities and land uses that can be found um, on that uh, section of street. Um, clothing, car sales, jewellery, leisure, professional services, um, health and beauty, grocery, a whole range of different activities that serve the needs of local and often uh, more distant communities. And equally with that, um, we can see a variety of different uh, restrictions and regulations. So the bottom three there uh, relate to Tooting and the top two uh, relate to Coventry, but giving an idea of along the curbside, uh, a great variety of regulations enabling or restricting different types of curbside activity. And obviously we're dealing with quite large numbers of goods and people. So here we're looking at the two streets, um, Mitcham Road, Upper Tooting Road um, in Southwest London. <clears throat> and you can see here the number of vehicles per hour uh, on those two roads. And we're talking about um, up to 1500 vehicles an hour on the roads that essentially are one way in each direction when you allow for parking, loading, buses stopping. On the right hand side, you can see we're talking about quite a lot of people boarding and lighting buses in the area. Um, the central one looks higher because it's a, it's a six hour period, the others are three hour periods. So if you halve that, we can see, still see that we're talking about five to 6,000 people an hour boarding and lighting for buses in that relatively small area. And also very large pedestrian flows. Um, you can see particularly um, on uh, Upper Tooting Road there on, on a Saturday, the left-hand side there, up to 20,000 pedestrians an hour going up and down uh, particular points on that street. So a very intensity, uh, intense use of that space. 
And these are some of the street activities taken from teaching, but also our other two sites, just, just photographs of the sorts of things that are happening on the street, street markets, um, stalls encouraging people to sign up for things, um, people just standing, waiting around, watching the world go by, waiting for buses, chatting to their friends and so on. A whole diversity and range of activity on the streets. And here's an example of, um, we, we use CCTV cameras to look at, um, if you look at the top left one there, you'll see in the center of that photograph on the left-hand side, there's a bench. And essentially we just looked at how through the day, at different times of day, uh, that bench and the surrounding space we use. And you can see it's used in different ways at different times of day. Sometimes it becomes the focus of things. Sometimes it almost becomes an obstacle for people trying to get by. Tooting in southwest London is on the, the northern line. It, it, uh, it's an important uh, station, um, but it only has an entrance on one side of the street, as you can see in the left-hand photograph. So um, using data we're able to obtain, we've got an indication of the number of people who were getting off buses and boarding uh, the underground there. On the left-hand side in the morning, where the buses coming from the south um, are on the same side of the road as the tube station entrance, but in the evening, people have to cross the road to get to uh, the buses taking them south, uh, further down into South London. And one of the things we discovered here, this is um, uh, information about which mode people use after they, they get a uh, off a bus. And you can see that around half then walk to a destination in the local area. And you can see the slightly um, paler or semi uh, orange color, the bottom right there. That's the proportion of people who get off the bus and go to the tube. That was felt to be the main activity there, that it was a railhead for people coming further south. But you can see actually that twice as many people changed to another bus uh, rather than just went to the tube. And that was something that hadn't been understood at all and certainly not been designed for. And all this intensity inevitably leads to a number of uh, collisions and pedestrian accidents. And on the picture here, you can see um, in yellow, the pedestrian accidents of various types occurring between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. And inevitably, Tooting Broadway in the top left there is a major junction. There are a whole number of pedestrian accidents there. But if you look down Mitcham Road particularly, you can see a lot of accidents associated with the bus stops. So people getting off the bus, rushing across the road to uh, get to the tube station or coming out the tube station, rushing across to get the bus. And this was something that hadn't really been appreciated before, how much uh, bus stops and, and activity can actually be linked to pedestrian um, injuries of various types. And the ones in blue are the ones that occur between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. And there are fewer of those, but you can see that a number of are linked to uh, pubs, restaurants and, and takeaways. We asked a series of questions about satisfaction with uh, local services. And broadly speaking, um, we've got uh, different results for Tooting, Ball Hill, Coventry, London Road, Sheffield. But you can see that broadly speaking, 80, 90% of people, both residents and visitors, like the range of shops, the quality of shops, the friendliness of people in the area. Although, of course, recognizing that it's a slightly self-selecting sample, if people didn't like it, they'd probably go somewhere else. But nevertheless, a high level of satisfaction with the, the shops and so on. Um, we also ask people whether they agreed with a statement. I usually bump into people I know when I'm out in the shopping area. And that's by length of time in the area. And not surprising, you can see people who've lived there under a year, 30, 40 percent, up to 50 percent are saying that they bump into people they know. People who've been there more than 10 years, we're, we're between around 70 and 95 percent. So they're very important places for informal contact and, and community support and engagement. But there are lots of areas of dissatisfaction as well. And, and um, the level of local amenities provided, people were dissatisfied with. They didn't like the availability of public spaces and greenery or seating or places to meet people or provision of public toilets. And that applied equally to residents and visitors. When we get to the traffic itself, again, very high levels of concern about the volume of road traffic, air pollution, traffic noise, safety. Um, interestingly, the, uh, the values in this case for the businesses are lower than for the people on the streets, but we think that's simply because the business people spend all day indoors, really. They're not actually exposed to the same extent as what's happening on the street. Um, 
And the other thing I think to bear in mind is that when we look at these streets, um, there are a very wide range of actors involved in um, designing, operating, maintaining the street. Um, obviously, there are um, departments within local authorities responsible for construction and maintenance, lighting and drainage, traffic regulation enforcement, building control, force, uh, enforcement of what happens on the footway, so advertising boards, street cleansing, the utilities, the police, the transport operators and various other people. And not only is this a complex environment, but it's one where responsibilities are widely distributed, which makes it really difficult to compared with, say, a purpose-built shopping centre where um, one organisation owns and more or less controls everything. These are really tricky situations, but one that um, are really important for people's everyday life and uh, therefore something that's worth looking at in more detail. So thank you very much for that. I'm going to now stop sharing my screen um, and invite um, Gabby and Jane to share theirs and tell us what they've been doing in Camden. Thank you. Oh, I just try and thank you. Thank you, Peter. That's um, a, a really great introduction to our presentation. So I'm now going to try and share my screen, which is always the uh, it's always the, the, the most difficult bit. Let's see. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah. Right. So um, thank you, Peter, for inviting us to to speak to you today. Um, my name is Jane de Bono. I'm here with my colleague, Gabby Abadi, and we work for the London Borough of Camden and we work in the Camden Future High Streets team. Um, so we're going to just talk you through uh, why we are focusing on the high streets. Um, what does the Camden Future High Streets programme mean? We're all going to, also going to just touch on the, the, the governance. So why have we set up the team in the way that we have? And then look at the Camden High Street's prospectus. And this is our guiding document that sets out the aims and objectives for the high streets in Camden. And then I'm going to hand over to Gabby and she will be talking about Kilburn as the case study. So um, how have we brought together these aims and objectives of the high streets programme and how is it playing out in Kilburn? Um, so firstly, uh, just for, you know, just for your information, so the little bit in, in, in red, that's Camden. We're a, an inner city London local authority. We're bounded to the east by Brent, which is the border with Kilburn that Gabby will talk about later. Um, and we are a very, very diverse borough. And we're very proud to be very diverse too. So we stretch from you know, the green fields of Hampstead Heath in the north to Soho in the south, and from Kilburn in the west to Kentish Town in the east. And I suppose that diversity of us as a borough is reflected in our high streets too. Um, the, this, of, and I'm sure you recognise it, is London. Um, and the, what it shows is the area of the GLA. Um, and that is the strategic authority um, that is responsible for strategic issues in London, like transport and policing and you know, government. And we um, operate in the local, uh, in Camden as the local authority. Um, so I suppose why, you know, why are we looking at high streets and why are they important to us? Um, and, you know, Camden high streets play, uh, have always played a crucial role in community, in community life. They historically have been the heart of commercial activity and public activity um, across London and across cities, probably across the world always been historically very important places for people to meet um, and there are places where residents and workers and visitors they, they shop and work and socialize but also access cultural services um, and enjoy themselves actually um, as well as you know providing the necessities for shopping and food and those kind of things but there are also places of employment so um, they provide a range of jobs and employment opportunities, quite often local, as well as international, and particularly in Camden. Um, and they support, they should, if they're functioning properly, support the health and well-being of our communities. Um, I suppose, uh, so Camden's high streets, along with all the others we're facing, and I think Peter's just talked about them, we're, we're, we're facing 
um, a number of issues before the pandemic. Um, and that was the shift to online um, shopping, the lack of diversity of use on our high streets, actually, so that we were, you know, we had coffee shops and um, and restaurants and bars, but not really anywhere where you could buy a fresh loaf of bread or uh, so there was and the there was a uniformity, I think, across some uh, quite a lot of our high streets. I suppose um, operationally before the pandemic hit, we um, we didn't have a high street focus. So the different services that operated in the local authority would operate almost independently on our high streets. So we would be so the highway itself was the responsibility of our transport and highway services. The buildings were the responsibility of planning and um, myself and Gabby are planners. So that's how you how you um, uh, so influence the kind of uses that were on the high street. Um, and then the businesses were supported through our economic development team, but they did really operate independently, um, which was fine. And, um, and we, you know, we, we were quite happy with the way that we were operating. But when the pandemic hit, it was clear that we had to almost pivot our services and focus on our high streets as that very important part of supporting um, businesses and communities to, to face the pandemic as it hit. Um, and by doing that, we had to bring together services um, and we set up what we call the Camden Future High Streets team. Um, and, that, and the aim of that was to look at our high streets, but also to try and support them through the impact of the pandemic, but then try and think about how we should be designing and supporting them for a robust recovery um, into a, a future that was sustainable and linked to those communities that perhaps had um, had that that link was probably a little bit more fragile. So what we did was we we instituted something called a test and learn approach, um, and that meant that we had we had the opportunities to um, to implement interventions at speed, um, which was supporting businesses, whether it was business improvement grants, those uh, business uh, support grants, and those kind of things. Um, but all, and also things like highways, changes to the highways, and reconfiguring the the the, the, um, the how high how the highways are used, um, and we began to kind of trial new activities. But at, so at the same time we were learning. So if they didn't work, then we would try something else. If they worked in some respect, we would then um, we would sort of iterate that and 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 design them. And of course. Um, and it was a very exciting time, actually, to be working in the high streets, but it was very, very, very quick. We had to do things, you know, very, very quickly to to respond to to what the businesses and our communities were going through. Um, and of course, we know that um, as we come out of the pandemic, um, that high streets will have to change and reinvent themselves. And part of the work that we do is supporting them to do that, um, and to continue the crucial role that, that they play at the centre of our communities but also to make that better, to, to make that more sustainable, to link those communities back to their high streets um, and to support those businesses. So our, our idea for, for our future high streets is that they will become the centre of creativity and innovation where they provide goods and services and employment and retain the value of our communities and pro provide sustainable and accessible environments. So that's the introduction of where we were. Now, this what this slide here shows is um, those different services and how the high streets program coordinated them. So as I talked about the kind of disparate activities on our high streets, supporting different, acts, different parts of how high streets function, whether as Peter talks about, whether it was around the movement or whether it was around the place and the high streets team um, provided this coordinating role so on the right hand side, <clears throat> I won't go through all the details here, but on the right hand side, um, you can see all of those different services that we brought together as part of the high streets program. And that's things like greening. So whether you know we were trying to get more green spaces in high streets for pe people to sit and to socialise and reconnect. Um, Section 106 and SIL, this is um, in, in London, this is a, a kind of local tax that you, you um, local payment that you get from development and it's a fund that's available to um, improve cities and we used it here for high streets looking at sustainability how we can sustain communities um, 
Things like comms were very important. So the love your high street, things like love your high street, support your local businesses. And that was very important as we were um, going through those really difficult times at the beginning of the pandemic. Highways and transport, obviously, um, that whole they were a crucial part of, of our approach to um, to uh, to supporting high streets planning, as I mentioned, participation. This was around engagement of not only businesses, but local communities as well. Um, property. So uh, Camden have um, we have our property portfolio, but we don't really have many um, assets on high streets because, as I said, traditionally they have been uh, commercial places and commercial spaces where we as a local authority don't have much assets, many assets. Um, as we know, the impact of the pandemic has led to high uh, degrees of vacancy, not consistent across Camden, actually, across our high streets, but there's a huge amount of businesses that have failed. Um, so what do we do with those, those properties? How do we get our hands on the keys of those commercial properties to introduce um, meanwhile uses and uses of social value? Um, arts and tourism, of course, um, high streets have always been a centre of, of, of culture, whether it's theatres or cinemas or pubs or gigs or all of those kind of things. Um, and then on the left hand side of the screen is an, an idea of the kind of things that we did. So um, the second one down is, is streeteries, which is just a terrible word and I just hate even saying it. Um, but streeteries are um, places where you sit in the street and you eat. Um, so this, these were introduced um, through the uh, COVID emergency measures. So we have the opportunity to take space from the highway um, and make some very quick um, uh, sort of uh, barriers uh, around these spaces so that people could eat outside safely um, during the height of COVID. Those temporary COVID measures, and they, these were introduced across Camden, um, and some of those will become permanent, um, hopefully will become permanent realignment of the street. Um, we also, uh, we set up something called the, the High Streets Action Group. We, we know that our high streets are facing these challenges and we as a local authority can't do that ourselves. So we brought together experts to try and help us untangle those key challenges that are facing our high streets. Um, and that was around things like vacancy. How do we get access to the keys? How do we tackle um, vacancy in our commercial, in commercial premises? Um, looking at the evening and nighttime economy, um, the evening and nighttime economy to support that in recovery means that we're supporting our high streets in recovery. So how do we do that when we know that hospitality has been hit so badly? Um, and digital high streets, how do we augment high streets to respond to the change to digital high streets and bring people back onto the high streets as well? So that's probably quite a lot of information there. But as you can see, we tried to bring together all the different services um, with a focus on our high streets. Um, and the, the, the map in the middle just shows the variety and diversity of high streets in Camden. So we have 38 neighborhood centers. We have six town centers. Um, and I don't, it's not very clear on this map, but there's a little brown line that runs across the, almost like the middle of Camden. Everything south of that line is the central activity zone. So that's central London. That is the commuter belt, the commercial heart of Camden. <clears throat> and it has been hit terribly by, by the pandemic because com commuters weren't going in. They weren't supporting the retail outlets and they weren't traveling in at all. Um, so that is the, 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 the space that the, um, the high streets, uh, future high streets team is in. But I think there was a, a change in political priorities as well, based on um, what, has hap what had hap happened. And that political buy-in from our cabinet members was crucial in setting up the team. Um, so we have our, the high streets team as a coordinating role with all of these, all of these different services on the high streets. And then we have a board above that, which is co-chaired by two of our key directors in the local authority. That then feeds into our members and the members are our, our elected politicians. And that governance has been crucial in, in moving the, the High Streets programme forward. So what, um, what is our vision for Camden High Streets? One of the things that we did was we produced what we called the future Camden High Streets prospectus. 
and this set out the aims and objectives of what we wanted to achieve, <clears throat> a lot of which I've, I've just been talking about. And we have a vision for our high streets. And the vision is for Camden high streets and town centres to be ready to face the future. We want them to be at the heart of their communities with all our residents able to reach their local centre by walking or cycling within 15 minutes or less. The high streets and town centres of tomorrow will be safe, family friendly, environmentally responsible, diverse, accessible and vibrant places to shop, work and socialise, share knowledge and skills, network, learn, make, live and play, which is you know, a great sentiment and that's what that is what we're working towards. Um, so we all know about the 15 minute city principle, which underpinned what we were what we were doing in Camden. But I guess it's not really a 15 minute city principle. It's a 15 minute high street principle. So we want people to be able to get to their high streets within 15 minutes um, uh, through walking or using public transport. And this sets out the um, high street objectives of Camden Future High Street objectives. So we're looking at community and economy and we want high streets to be the heart of the community and economy again. Um, diverse uses, we want to ensure that um, we make the, the uses that exist on our high streets reflective of the communities to bring them back onto the high streets um, and also reflective of the needs of how high streets are going to have to operate in the future. Inviting public realm, um, and this is, of course is a big one, uh, high streets are roads and they've got vehicles on them and um, quite often they're not pleasant places to be so how can we use this focus on our high streets to um, redesign um, the public realm to make it inviting make it make it those places where people want to go and sit and enjoy themselves and then finally we want them to be sustainable and accessible so that everybody can access high streets um, and use them and get benefit from them so just as I finish now, just the other, the, the other side of the slide shows all of those objectives in, in more detail um, with that 15 minute high street principle. And this, this, covers, this covers a lot of the things that we're trying to achieve, which Gabby will, will talk about more in relation to, um, to Kilburn. So goods and services for the community. We want innovative, sustainable businesses that provide social value. Um, opportunities for jobs and training, local jobs and training, particularly in, in uh, hospitality and skills. Um, we want we look, need to look at the evening and nighttime economy, um, but also we want the public to be at the centre of the community of our community life, and we want these streets to be accessible and sustainable, um, with um, green spaces and informal places to meet. So that was quite a lot from me. Um, and we're obviously very, I'm very happy to take questions on that um, at the other end of the presentation, but I'd line up now like to hand over to Gabby. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you, Joan. And in the presenting mode, do you mind on the top left of the screen, just click, clicking from current slide on the top left? Top left. Oh, so maybe top right. <laughs> um, just the, the top of the screen, it says from beginning and then from current slide. Uh, we pressed okay. the current yeah. slide. Got yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. So yeah, as Jane highlights, um, looking to the future, Camden uh, wants to support specific high streets where particular challenges and opportunities have been recorded. Um, Kilburn is one of those areas um, where we're seeking to work to better understand local context and collaborate with key partners and stakeholders in order to meet the needs and aspirations of the businesses and the people in our town centres and high streets. I'm just going to provide an overview of the area and our programme and then some of our partnership work and um, projects coming out um, in Kilburn. So uh, Kilburn uh, is an area of northwest London in England, which spans the boundary of three London boroughs, so Camden in the east, Brent to the west, and uh, the lower part of the Kilburn High Road is actually in the London Borough of Westminster. However, it's um, the two councils, Brent and Camden, who are responsible for the majority of the high road. Um, Kilburn High Road is a densely populated neighbourhood um, that has a rich history. The Watling Street and the modern A5 road forms the contemporary boundary between the boroughs of Brent and Camden. And their areas also identified 
in the statutory spatial development strategy for the Greater London area, which is also known as the London Plan, as one of the 35 major centres in Greater London. It's also the second largest town centre within our borough of Camden. Several formal consultation processes and conversations over the years have identified um, significant issues local people passionately care about and key potential opportunities as well. In response, um, our uh, Future High Streets team has identified Kilburn as a key area of focus. Um, we're very much not starting from scratch. Kilburn is home to a significant number of active and passionate organisations, community groups and business owners who are already successfully bringing people together and sharing information delivering um, vital services and also um, already improving the quality of life of people in the neighbourhood. There are existing um, larger scale opportunities um, beyond our service uh, plan for the area. Um, this includes phased highway improvement, uh, work across the high street, aspirations to enhance the public realm, which includes future scoping of locations for greening, uh, seating, parklets and street streets, as uh, Jane touched on, and plans as well for improvement to um, the biggest park in the area, which is the Kilburn Grange Park, in order to better connect the highly valued green space with the nearby high street. Um, our team have also identified important funding opportunities that are key to supporting uh, positive future change through crowdfunding platforms, uh, community infrastructure levy, um, and the Greater London Authority's High Street for All Challenge that I'm going to be touching on later. Uh, just on the next slide, um, we'll touch on some of the challenges and opportunities in Kilburn um, at a very high level. So uh, discussions with um, local people in Kilburn, uh, consultation findings over the years, and also insights gathered um, through research highlight significant pride in Kilburn. There are many reasons to celebrate Kilburn as a high road. Uh, it's a street of unique independent stores, delicious food options, um, very established uh, culture and community venues um, that bring a lot of energy to the area. Uh, Kilburn is also very well connected to transport wise to the rest of London with access to overground and underground to the north of the street, as many as um, and as many as six bus routes. There's also a strong sense that there are many challenges to be addressed. So uh, a wide range of competing demands that Peter touched on um, in relation to the use of the high road. Um, We've been told, for example, the street is noisy and congested, the area is polluted with a high level of traffic and narrow pavements, um, public spaces of poor quality that feel very unloved and, cl and cluttered. Um, there also lies this perception that Kilburn has been forgotten over the years due to its uh, location um, as a borough boundary and therefore lack of perceived council coordination. And of course, all this has only been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, on the next slide, um, We'll talk about partnership work. So, yeah, the successful and equitable regeneration of Kilburn High Road would not be possible without coordinated partnership work. So, one of our main roles as a team is to coordinate and support the joined up work with uh, key statutory transport and planning authorities, so the GLA, TFL, our neighbouring boroughs, so Brent um, mostly, and local organisations and community groups. Um, as mentioned, Kilburn's home to a range of organisations that have been working on impactful projects and initiatives for many years. And so it's imperative that we identify and recognise these networks of organisations and the work that they do. So to build on um, as we continue to develop a vision for Kilburn's High Street. My colleague and I have been meeting with local organisations, um, building a rapport uh, with them um, and the relationship with these key partners. Uh, both in person and virtually uh, over the last six months or so in order to best develop our understanding of their experiences and also their ambitions for Kilburn. Um, establishing an internal working group uh, with key council services at an operational level has been really important to ensure joint up planning and delivery of day-to-day -day work. Um, our working group have included offices from services that Jane touched upon before, including transport and green spaces, uh, planning enforcement and culture and arts. Um, yeah, so also supporting uh, positive change and delivering Kilburn High Road has meant renewing our commitment to work more closely with Brent Council um, in order to like, truly respond to you know, the lived experiences of our community in this area and establish um, the high street as a place and ecosystem. Uh, the two councils need to work more collaboratively. And this renewed commitment involves uh, fortnightly meetings with the town centre manager in Brent, who's our counterpart, 
uh, where we sort of catch up on projects we're working on together across borough boundary at operational level. And then every couple of months, we hold a wider town, uh, Kilburn Town Centre strategy meeting with varied heads of services. Um, so from both councils to discuss uh, collaboration at more strategic levels. We also um, go for regular walkabouts and site visits with our brown, ca brown counterparts. Um, it's really important to experience the street for yourself if you're planning for the area, of course. And um, also, uh, with, uh, we've also been uh, joining up our work with uh, on high streets with the work streams of the Strategic Planning Authority in London to the GLA and the Strategic Transport Authority in London TfL, which I'll touch on more on the next slide, please. Um, so, um, well, sorry, almost finished. So in response to COVID-19, uh, the GLA issued a High Streets for All challenge, which was um, a call for high street partnerships to develop in a innovative uh, high street strategies and asset-based ba asset proposals prepared to boost economic activity and civic renewal, as well as yield wider public value. Our team have been successful in a bid for funding, being awarded a total of £175,000, including uh, 20k of capital funding for smaller projects that have the potential to be significant catalysts for wider change in and around uh, the Kilburn High Road and the hinterlands. So um, the projects we've received funding for are both strategic and action orientated. So supporting our Camden High Street objectives to have quick impact, support footfall, but also help to mobilize and galvanize local groups and build that momentum for future funding bids as and when opportunities arise. Um, the aim of the High Street for All challenge is to support this a collaborative vision for our chosen area of Kilburn. Um, and this vision is not about creating a big hefty planning document, but rather supporting local partnerships to form um, and mobilize strategically, but day to day as well, to help support the holistic planning for Kilburn as a vibrant place to live, visit and work. Um, to support our funding bid, we created a sort of snapshot document, uh, which we could share after the presentation, uh, where, and we're currently building on this for an urban design analysis uh, to support vision of Kilburn as a place, rather than just a cross borough boundary or just a thoroughfare road for traffic. Um, on the screen, we've got some examples of the projects we've been awarded funding to take forward, which include working with Brent to commission a mural painting to enhance a national rail owned bridge. So this is supporting our Camden Future High Streets inviting public realm objective um, to contribute to the sense of place and identity and community ownership over the high street in a way which builds upon the area's local distinctiveness. Um, and this will be done through commissioning a local artist um, or a group of artists to getting and who need to get residents involved in the design. Um, another project um, aims to support Camden's future high streets objective of diverse use. Um, so we're looking to support the fit out and also meanwhile activation of a vacant uh, former fish and chip shop, um, a building owned by a um, very small building owned by TFL, uh, which, where we'll be seeking uh, applications from community groups to support partnership building and project development. We don't have a fixed view of what this looks like. We're very open to a wide range of ideas for local groups to come and put their unique stamp on the space. Um, and a final project I'll just touch on is the Library of Things. So this is in support of um, our sustainable and accessible objective at Camden Future High Streets um, team. So the, the Library of Things are a not-for-profit social enterprise that install um, kiosks and equip local libraries with useful household items uh, people can borrow and support sharing and circular economy ambitions that we have here at Camden, as well as um, London. This would be the second installment in Camden, the first is in Kentish Town. Um, and then finally, um, on the next slide, uh, through this funding stream, we were also successful in securing one of two opportunities to work with a group called Power to Change to scope a community improvement district ambition for Kilburn. Um, this will be the first of two to test um, this concept in England, so that's really exciting. Um, and Power to Change define a community improvement district as a non-political a non-profit distributing group, which provides opportunities for community organizations to complement local mechanisms, work alongside businesses and other stakeholders to steer the development of their neighborhoods, especially with a town center focus. We're really excited about this opportunity to scope working with um, key local partners towards a, a community-led collective vision um, and delivery of projects for Kilburn. 
Um, so yeah, thank you very much for listening to Jane and I, and hopefully our presentation provides a flavour of some of our team's work at Camden Council. Well, thank you very much to Jane and Gabby. That was fascinating. It's good to see it's actually moving forward on the ground, and, and um, I'm sure that will be interesting to many other local authorities uh, around the country. Um, perhaps I can invite Pedro now to give a few re reflections on what we discussed, but also to draw on your vast experience. Maybe you, do you want to, I don't think I had a very good job of introducing you and your previous experience. Was it a little bit about what role you used to play in Lisbon? And then I'll invite you to make some comments. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, congratulations for a wonderful presentation. I, I look forward to visiting Camden as soon as possible. Um, <laughs> I'm an architect by training. I worked for the city of Lisbon for around 21 years and with different hats. I started out as a political advisor. I worked as a designer, a planner, a strategist, a consultant, a trainer, and also as an undercover advocate for sustainable mobility and pedestrian safety. So lots of roles. And it basically um, provided me with a, uh, let's say, a multifaceted perception of how local administration uh, thinks or doesn't think or decides or basically doesn't decide um, and about the role that both elected officials and uh, technical practitioners such as uh, Gabrielle and Jane, um, the important role that they have to play. So that's as a way of introduction. Um, if um, I'll try to be brief, which is what everybody who says before they go on forever. So Peter, please feel free to uh, interrupt me. Okay, when you've had enough, it's just, there's a button here, you can mute me. I think conferences made so easier these days, right? So yeah, so I would like to share, well, I was asked to come in and provide the perspective of the European cities. As you may know, most of you, Polis is a, the leading network of European cities and regions committed to um, uh, innovation and transport but specifically to innovations that can make urban mobility become more sustainable, safe, and equitable. So we're not necessarily the tech geeks. Um, and I would, I would maybe say that uh, I would see uh, six key challenges um, facing uh, cities, urban mobility, the high street, and what we think about it, uh, and what we do about it. One of them would be, the first one would be, I think, a, a conceptual challenge. I can share here my profession, my personal experience. When I started uh, studying, when I started in college studying architecture, I remember once I was fascinated to discover the uh, map of Rome done in 1748 by Gian Battista Noli. And the interesting thing about this map of Rome, if you go and Google it, is that uh, Noli is that the thing there, the, 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 the heart of the map is not the buildings, it's the public space. And all the buildings are painted in like in, matte, in black. But the interesting thing is, Noli includes in the public realm and the public space, the streets, the piazzas, the piazzettas, and the interior of, in the floor level of the public buildings. So the interior of the churches, the interior of all sorts of public buildings, they are part of the public Rome that fascinated me. And I remember that years later when I was finishing my degree, I came across this other fascinating uh, and terrifying study by Donald Appleyard about livable streets and where he studied in 1980, uh, st uh, he studied three parallel streets in San Francisco. Um, and he uh, determined, you know, he, he showed how um, the amount of traffic uh, has a direct impact on the social life, uh, of those streets on what the residents on those streets perceive as their territory, as their street. I remember that uh, in the streets with lower amounts of traffic, uh, many residents perceive the whole street as their street, which seems as natural, but in the street with a higher amount of traffic, some residents uh, perceive their street as only their apartment, which was uh, very depressing. And also how this, the way that traffic behaves also has even an impact in the internal home arrangement uh, of especially where in the streets where there was less traffic, the uh, sleeping areas will be on the street, which would make the street safer 24 seven because there's always somebody listening to what happens on the street and in the streets with higher traffic, 
the, 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 the sweeping areas were moved inward and away from the street. And so finally, my third experience was when I started working and trying to change, um, introduce uh, traffic calming uh, and uh, changing the use of streets, making them more friendly for pedestrians. Uh, I always found it fascinating that when you want to change, and in, in I, I, this happened in my city, and I'm pretty sure it happens in uh, many local administrations around Europe, is that when you want to change the public space, you need to get permission from the traffic department. If you want to change the parking, if you want to, you know, reduce a lane or whatever, introduce traffic calming, you need permission from the traffic department. But the traffic department doesn't need permission from you to manage the lanes, the traffic signs, whatever. So there is really an asymmetry of power within local administrations all around Europe. And it, they're very rare, the good practices where, you know, there is some sort of a symmetry of power between those working on place and those working on movement. I hope that the, um, the place movement matrix uh, that the MORE project worked on, um, I hope, Peter, really that it is well disseminated um, because it can be really, really useful. The second challenge would be the capacity challenge, meaning here that when we talk about European cities, what are exactly we talking about? Uh, the European has the European Union has around this is before Brexit uh, around 800 cities with more than 50,000 residents, but of these, 700 are small, medium-sized cities with between 50 and uh, 250,000 uh, residents. So the vast majority of um, cities of European cities are in reality um, small and medium sized cities. And the way that this has directly uh, two implications uh, when we talk about change, one of them is that the speed and the intensity of the change that is happening to urban mobility um, happens differently according to these cities. It's not only a east-west divide or a north-south divide. It's also about, for example, uh, when we look at what happened with the e-scooters. I mean, you have e shared e-scooters in almost, I mean, in all big European cities, but many of the small and medium-sized European cities do not have them yet. And because obviously these uh, services deploy where more money is to be made. And so, I mean, maybe some people consider e-scooters a hassle and a problem and good thing they're not here. But the thing is that small and medium-sized cities also have more difficulty in attracting shared mobility services. The other implication this has is obviously with the organizational capacity of local administration uh, to deal with change. Uh, so you will have less staff available. The staff that is available is more overburdened with overloaded with work and with immediate the need to provide immediate replies and has less time and less ac and less access to uh, opportunities to learn more and to update uh, its knowledge. The know-how is also more limited because you know in bigger cities they have access to more consultants to more. Uh, different researchers, and that's not the case in small and medium-sized cities. The processes, the organizational processes to deal with, for example, public space management, for example, to develop design guidelines for urban space, for public space. This, the availability of the, of the processes, it's also because to build these organizational processes, it's something that, again, takes time and takes staff and takes know-how, which is usually uh, less available in small and medium-sized cities. Also the money issue. Um, and I would say also the, the uh, when we talk about the capacity, it's not only the capacity of the practical, of the practi technical practitioners, let's say, but also the capacity of the political staff. So not only the elected officials, but also the uh, political advisors around them. So. All of this um, poses several additional challenges to deal with change, on top of which I would say uh, is in the middle of all this mess of people trying to deal with what's coming at them, 
the, the, the lack of clear goals, the lack of clear purpose, I would say, is one of the biggest problems. I really like the fact when Jane uh, was able to explain what's the purpose, what's the vision for their high street. And uh, when you look at many projects uh, for public space and for public space strategy, what you see is the what comes before the why. You know, you see, let's do this, let's do that, let's do this because we saw this here, we saw this, that, let's 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 try to transplant it here. But and then we come up with, oh yeah, and public space is the space of encounter and the civility and civities and all of that. That comes after. Um, it's not it's not projects guided by a vision, um, which should be so this clarity of goals is a big problem. Um, also for governance and for regulation, because if you don't know what you want, then you will be inevitably reactive and defensive to change. You'll try to fend it off, to control it as much as you can, even if you don't have the capacity, that's your attitude. Whereas if you know what you want, then you can be proactive and then you can find opportunities in the, in the change that's uh, coming at you. So the capacity challenge is first of all, I would say, uh, the challenge of clarifying what you want, which is a, a long way. Um, thirdly, the suburban challenge. When we think about cities today, we have to think about wider urban areas because the, what happens in these wider urban areas obviously has an effect on high street. Well, that's probably where most of the workers from high street are coming and where most of the goods sold in high street are coming. It's from these wider urban areas, call them suburban, peri-urban, sometimes even rural. So, uh, and the people living in these areas, they are facing a, tough, a very tough choice be between, you know, they're either, they've either become car dependent or captive users of public transport. Uh, the people who, have, who, are, who cannot afford to be car dependent, they dream of other options. And, Shared mobility is finally emerging to be an alternative. The big problem is that the shared mobility offer is basically concentrated on urban centers. That's not where we need more mobility offer. And people who have become car dependent, there was a very interesting study published in Nature uh, magazine the last year where these German researchers showed that people, first of all, spend a lot of money, up to 20 to 25% of their family revenue on the car, but also that they are completely unaware of the amount of money they're spending on, um, on, on the car. So the thing here being that um, these people who are middle class or lower middle class who have become car dependent, uh, obviously uh, when we apply to them to reduce car use, we apply one of the classical measures that have been studied in transport policy for years, you know, road charging, let's charge them more for, 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 for parking, et cetera, et cetera. We are not solving their mobility problems and we are obviously aggravating the costs that they have to support. So no wonder that the Gilets Jaunes uh, jump off and start becoming completely aggressive because people need mobility solutions and we have to develop a new portfolio of policy measures to deal with that, almost there. Um, the fourth challenge I would say is the digital challenge. Um, you know, not only, uh, you know, learning how to deal with computers and re re dealing with the data that the cities has, I would point, you know, obviously to the two things that digitalization and automation have be are, are becoming, have enabled and are enabling to, to become even more uh, prevalent. One of them obviously is e-commerce with all the implications that has for, for high street not only in terms of uh, uh, increasing traffic and the diversity of traffic, also the challenge for the, the curb management, also the challenge for the survival of shops. Um, you know, uh, I would say that uh, the traditional fear of merch of local shop owners that don't take away parking or you'll kill, uh, or you'll kill my shops, I think they will soon understand that the biggest challenge is coming, or they know probably already, is not from, they will be probably begging us to take away parking in some years from now, because they will, they have to find a way to, 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 to compete with uh, e-commerce. And obviously uh, also the, the, on the life of street, I mean, close here to my office, I just noticed the other day when I was walking home at night that they've opened what is called now a dark kitchen. So it's basically a kitchen that has no restaurant. They just cook for delivery at home. 
And it's very weird because it's a kitchen. It has a shop window all along. And you, they, you, know, you can't eat there. And what does that mean for the, the, the active edge of buildings? Another uh, challenge, obviously, is teleworking. Not that it's, it didn't show up with COVID. It's been ex highly accelerated by COVID. But it, it, in, in essence, it, it's been enabled by digitalization. Obviously, we have to bear in mind that you know the more teleworking we have, just for example, a one day of teleworking per week automatically means a 20% drop in footfall in, air, in office areas and in clientele. Uh, how are how are local shops going to deal with that? Obviously, that also has other implications because it also means less ridership. Everybody's saying, oh, public transit because uh, people are afraid to go to public transport. They're not. They're just stuck at home or they're unemployed, which is another question. Thirdly, this obviously has implications for the essential workers, the so-called essential workers. They're not going to be teleworking anytime soon. They're still going to be uh, commuting to the to the supermarkets, to the pharmacies, to the restaurants. They're cleaning street uh, sweeping jobs. So, how will we at the same time be able to provide them with proper service? And finally, obviously, teleworking will going to fast enable and accelerate the offshoring of jobs in the in the third sector. What are we going to do about it when our jobs start getting offshore to countries where they're cheaper? Uh, finally, there's the, the, the climate challenge. Obviously, it is a challenge for high street because obviously the climate instability will lead to economic instability. Economic instability will feed social unrest. And this social unrest will put a high demand on organizations, starting with public authorities. So we will, be, uh, we will have to rush to more and more emergencies. Uh, that will decrease our margin of resilience, that will put high stress on our political decision processes. And obviously, all these problems will be felt more intensively and probably, first of all, in cities and in high streets. And the point here is that we are we now today, when we think about things we can do to, to our uh, street networks, to make them more resilient, to uh, heat waves, to, to, to uh, floods, et cetera, et cetera, what we see is that we have our tie, our hands tied behind our backs because of the car monopoly over public space. We need to reduce the amount of asphalt to deal with heat waves. Well, we can't because there's parking. We need to put in trees and more shade. Well, we can't because that's parking. And so we, the, the, the biggest problem now we face to deal with the climate crisis in cities is that we have our hands tied behind our back because of the climate of the car monopoly over public space. If it's a monopoly, it's not about being against cars. It's about rebalancing, uh, finding a proper balance uh, for our public life. And finally, thank you for your patience, everybody and Peter. Um, the political challenge. I mean, there has been, um, all of this implies political challenges, of course, but I think that in many cities, uh, you know, cities all across Europe have to deal with even if they are aware, some are not, with hu a, a huge cultural shift. Uh, and I would point out too, I mean, one of them is obviously the gender perspective. Women are getting more access to jobs, to their own uh, uh, life, to, um, to getting more power. That's wonderful. And what we see is that this transport profession that for decades was made by and for middle-aged men thinking about driving their cars to and from office, now has to deal as 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 to understand, seek to understand the needs and the preferences of this small minority we call women, just 52% of the population. I don't know why we even care. Uh, and also about the 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 how the of the shortcomings of um of, of mobility systems including for example in terms of security women are subject to persistent sexual harassment in public transport and in public space no wonder many of them as soon as they can get a car so how would we deal with that uh, it's a transport issue it's obviously also a human rights issue a legal issue but it is a transport issue and transport professionals have to think about it have to deal with it and finally also the generational thing you know people uh, getting a driver's license 
is no longer the rite of passage into adulthood as it, as it was for my generation and Peter's. Um, it's, it's people don't get their driver's license. They don't have the money to get a car. They, don't, they have a very changing uh, mobility pattern. You can't have a car for that. And younger people, obviously, like Greta, people joke about Greta, but Greta is basically the symbol of a generation that is demanding action, that is demanding leadership. Uh, at the more final event, Pascal Smet was saying that we have to make people, sometimes leadership has to make people happy against their will. Well, I'm not sure that he understands their will. What is the will of the people? We have to understand that public authorities and the political debate around mobility and public space has, uh, is biased. And is biased because it fails to understand, number one, that in every city, more than half of the households do not have a car it fails to understand that the voices coming formally to us through letters, emails, participation in public council meetings is biased by the higher social capital of people who having jobs, university, uh, availability to participate in these things. I mean, they, they tend to be the ones who own cars that so they bias all the, 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 the input coming into us for, by, via formal channels, they bias it towards the needs and the preferences of car owners. And because social media is leading to radicalization. I mean, check out any discussion about bike lanes in any city and you will see radical, radical positions in very little of Dolly, in very little in, in, in the way of dialogue. So the last sentence is basically, you know, uh, is the high streets, uh, obviously, the high street with all its visibility and it, with its central role in the life of communities, it's obviously a, an indispensable place to discuss the future of our city, the future of our streets, the future of our um, social life and mobili individual mobility. So the question is, you know, if the high street is going to become a place professionally uh, for uh, dialogue and evolution, or if it's going to be, you know, the, the high street of uh, cowboy Western movies where it's high noon for a cowboy duel, where radicalized police positions of put the bike lane, take out the bike lane. I mean, I think professionals like the ones around the table have a key role uh, in structuring, informing this dialogue, and also, I would say, uh, advocating for, um, for uh, sustainable mobility. It's not like we have to. Uh, wait for political will to drop out of the sky. Every one of us should be actively within their own organizations building the political will for uh, sustainable mobility. I mean, it's what, for example, doctors do in the health system. They advocate internally for better health systems. It's what lawyers do within the legal system. They advocate for the rights of defendants, for example, and for due legal process. And so I think it's the same thing that we, we have to stop talking about the political will that isn't there and uh, start building it ourselves with elected officials, with public opinion, etc. but not just wait for it to happen. I hope that helps. I'm sorry if I took too long. Oh no, thank you. Fascinating as always, Pedro. Thank you very much for, for coming along. Um, just wondering, actually, Gabby or Jane, did you want to comment on that or did that stimulate any other thoughts you wanted to, to mention briefly? Um, oh, there were so many, there were so many things, actually. Um, I think there's, um, I, I suppose, one of the, the, the things that um, it highlights is the fact that, you know, nobody wanted a pandemic and nobody wanted the impacts of a, of, of a pandemic on our society and communities and high streets but I think what it has done by highlighting the inequality of access to high street services and the high streets themselves it's allowed us to really reimagine high streets for the future that's the idea so we're taking what it's shown us what we've known really but what it's really showing us and trying to um, to redesign our high streets to to make them the equitable places that they should have always been. And of course, that's very difficult because they're very complicated spaces and places. So um, I suppose that's one thing. I think there was another, another thought that I had as well was in terms of um, what, are, what are our high streets facing in terms of the, the space, actually the space. And one of the things in London, and it must be the same elsewhere as well, 
is um is that that you know the delivery services which are commercial these are commercial um enterprises where you've got motorbikes everywhere all over high streets picking up things and delivering things and you know how as urban designers do we design high streets to take account of those that that new space that's being taken up by motorbikes is that something that we want what to want to think about and that relates as well Pedro to what you're talking about dark kitchens and um, we've been doing a piece of work with another one of Peter's colleagues at UCL and one of the things that it's showing us is where these dark kitchens are are are, are operating from and they're not on the high street obviously because high streets are really expensive places so they're outside of the high streets in the kind of high street hinterland um, and you know what 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 does that mean for how our high streets operate? So there's all of these challenges that we that we've really got to think very carefully about how how we um, how we look at those and how we design for them. And I suppose the last thing that I would say is that I was talking about how south of the Euston Road um, is the central activities zone, and there is a huge. I mean, I don't think this is going to change anytime soon. Is the fact that people are not coming into central London on Mondays or Fridays. So people are only coming in Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays. And what does that mean in terms of, of how high streets operate? You know, do we really reconfigure all of those uses so that they encourage people to come in on a Friday? Or do we can concentrate those uses on the times when commuters are in there? So lots of questions, I think. But yeah, thank you. It's really yeah, stimulated lots of thoughts for me. Gabby, did you want to add anything? No, James covered that beautifully. I'm going to wait for the Q&A. Thank you. OK, great. Right. Um, somebody uh, anonymous put a question in the Q&A saying, what about normal streets in quotes? I mean, not, not the high streets. Are there, are there lessons and things that we ought to be thinking about for, I guess, more residential streets and so on? Do you want to comment? Anybody want to comment on that? I think, I, oh yeah, go on. Sorry, Pedro. Yes. Um... I mean, we there. There's this thing called uh, you. You learn about it in ergonomics. It's called target fixation. It's thing, it's it's when a when a pilot uh, fixates on a on a target, and he can act and fixates it so much he forgets about everything else and can actually ram his plane against a against a, a mountain. It, it's something that happens uh, once in a while. So you fixate on the target, you forget everything else. And uh, when I started working on pedestrian accessibility many years ago, I remember that the standard approach was, well, let's get a, a very important street, let's use it as a pilot, make a great project there, and then you know everybody will see how pedestrian space can be wonderful and everybody will actually uh, apply that principle to the rest of the street network. And I found out that uh, that's a bit like waiting for Godot or like for the white whale. You know, it's 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 very difficult because the high street concentrates so many challenges and stakeholders and users that it's very difficult for anybody to let you do anything there. So it's easier actually to go to go the other way around and start experimenting and implementing new improvements in the so-called normal streets, so residential streets, streets that the people from the traffic department don't really care about. Uh, and that's the best place actually to start creating precedent by implementing traffic calming measures, changing, um, uh, reducing through traffic, et cetera, et cetera. And then when you can easily obtain those victories, then uh, moving into high street is inevitable. By then you have the internal power to do it. So that's kind of a tactic reply. I don't know if that's was the question. Right, Jane, do you want to? Come back in on that. Or? Oh well, I was going to. I was going to say. Um, so we talked about the diversity of high streets in in Camden, and um, and so I, I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure if you have a. An, you certainly don't have a normal high street. There's such a di there's such diversity, and I guess um, so. We as a council have probably more influence on smaller high streets. So those smaller parade of shops where we have more ownership of them actually. So. We can probably have more ways of, of in, sort of introducing more diverse uses there, but um, I guess it's that. So the the ecosystem. So I, well, I suppose the other thing I would say, and I'm probably I'm not a transport planner, so I'm probably really simplifying things here. But um, in Camden, in the residential streets, it's the car parking is probably more controversial than it is on high streets. 
So though implementing changes to, to people's residential car parking is very, very difficult. And that's where the challenge is. Whereas actually on high streets, especially when we, you know, we've got work with TfL, but the high streets that we have responsibility for, we have more opportunities to, to change and influence, I think, and to remove car parking on those streets. And I think one of the things in terms of the street trees that I was talking about, with these emergency COVID measures, we could do something very quickly on high streets, which was much more difficult to do in residential streets because there was more opposition often. That's very interesting. Thank you. Francesco, um, have, have I missed any comments or questions that we ought to be addressing or shall I move on? I think you can you can move on, Peter. Um, there was, okay, well, there'll be a chance yeah. for the other things yeah. at the end as well then, yeah. Okay, well, we've been talking about addressing current challenges and, and looking forward to the future. So just very briefly, um, I'm just going to share... Um, very few slides um, about looking more to the future. And then I'll hand over to Miho, who's got a lot of interesting things to say to you. Um, as, as we've said in, in the sense already, urban streets are places where conflicts arise and public policy measures are experienced on the ground. So we have these high level policies, GLA, borough level about improving public health, economic regeneration, decarbonisation, crime reduction, they all play out on our streets, normal streets and our busy streets. Um, and these are the places where we can see the effects of changing patterns of demand and supply, whether it's population demographics or decline of traditional retail stores or the e-scooters and obviously in the future things like drones and autonomous vehicles. So that if we're talking, for example, um, in uh, economic terms, then what we can do to actually improve the economic situation is to increase accessibility and provide good pedestrian infrastructure in order to promote the local economy and counter the tendency for the decline of physical stores in commercial streets that we've talked about. Um, on the social level, then we can do things that will help to achieve a more sustainable mode split and improve good quality public spaces. And as a result of that, as we've discussed already, it actually helps in social interaction and cohesion. Uh, we can improve personal security. We can reduce community severance, the effects of heavy traffic roads. We can encourage physical activity, reduce stress, and also improve um, traffic safety. And then in the environmental terms, um, there again, by improving environment, uh, improving uh, sustainable mode shares and also providing green areas, we cut noise and pollution, we can improve the visual environment, um, we can deal with issues around soil contamination, water runoff, we can improve local microclimates, and we can reduce energy consumption, CO2 emissions. So I think the point I just make here is that um, actually what we do on the streets uh, is not just affecting those streets, it, it has a large influence on the extent to which we can deliver urban wide or even national policies. And of course, as we've said, the, the COVID crisis accelerated these trends, shifting actives to, from the physical to the online world. At the same time, it's meant that people have used local spaces more and places and been able to walk and cycle, uh, and also has encouraged politicians to actually be a bit more adventurous in promoting active modes and putting more space, space for streeteries and things like that. Um, and I think we'll give people in many situations courage and confidence to sort of move forward. So really, cities are facing pressures and opportunities. Street usage patterns become more intense, occurring competition between different modes, diverse and variable. Um, as we as mentioned just now, we're now finding post COVID that Monday and Friday um, peak traffic flows are reduced. So the use is more concentrated. Also, actually, I think in, in the UK, Saturdays come back very strongly as well. Um, but different temporal patterns and spatial patterns and advances in sense technologies and in booking and navigation systems means, as we heard, that cities, and that opens up possibilities for being reactive in real time, using space much more flexibly and dynamically as conditions vary from day to day. And there's really two aspect, broad aspects looking forward. One is how patterns of demand might change. And I'm just briefly uh, put up a slide here from work that TfL has been doing in the last few years, looking at how London might develop in the future demographically and in terms of um, the dynamic the dynamism behind the economy. So we've got three possibilities there. Innovating London, where it reinvents itself as a young urban innovator, Ch technology changing how people live and work, um, 
leaving some behind, but nevertheless, almost a, a rejuvenating population. Rebalancing London, where society becomes more equal, but also more aging, lower economic growth, more focus on self-sufficiency and livability, but, but the real di dynamo moves to the east or accelerating London, where we're talking about building on trends pre-COVID, where it was growing, expanding, beating heart of a world financial system, but as a result of that can struggle to live a high quality of life for all. Um, and each of these have been looked at across the whole of London uh, and used in, in traffic models and transport models to actually look at what, how that might affect patterns of demand across the network and usage of different high streets and so on. And then of course, on the supply side, we know that there are a number of issues around that um, are beginning to, or potentially shortly will, uh, also provide opportunities and pressures on the high street. So um, looking towards autonomous vehicles, what will that mean for, um, for patterns of movement, particularly for our high streets? I mean, if we go back 50 or 60 years, there was a big focus on separating motor traffic from pedestrians through guard railing and restrictions and underpasses and, and pedestrian bridges. And we've got rid of most of those and we're now having a much more fluid space. But is there a risk that with autonomous vehicles that are more likely to stop if somebody jumps in front of them, that pedestrians and cyclists will become a bit more aggressive and therefore there might be pressures to bring back that segregation. And then the second one, the real opportunities from sensors and LED technology to actually um, use or, or signal the use of the space of the street in real time using LED signs and road markings, something here very experimental um, of actually having panels that light up when pedestrians want to cross the road. And then obviously things like drones, um, initially for parcels, but also whether we're going to have more air taxis and whether that will have impacts. Um, on the one hand, taking pressure off uh, the high streets, but also potentially, I guess, we may get to the point where there's a big public reaction against drones going over people's gardens and private spaces. So it might be they get channeled along high streets. So they also become air channels as well as ground channels of movement. And then there are these more specific things, which Miha will talk about in a moment, around advances in street lighting, greater use of CCTV, smart benches and bus stops. All these things are beginning to impact um, our streets and will have a much stronger influence in the future. Here's one example, uh, smart grid cities, which is already being trialed in several places where people can book a space, um, a virtual space in real time. And that space on the curb is not available for stopping unless you already have reserved a space online. Um, and that's allowing us to better, in a sense, make use of the space we have to use it more efficiently. And there'll be many more examples of that in the coming years. And as part of that, one of the things we've been stressing in more that this is an opportunity for cities actually to grasp the nettle and become proactive rather than reactive. Because what tends to happen or has happened with things like e-scooters and so on is that um, cities have sort of stood back really until they've happened and then decided, what should we do about it and be very reactive. And what we're suggesting is that really cities should become more proactive in the way in which, in regulating the way in which their spaces are used. So crudely speaking, we might divide the street, particularly busier streets into footways, cycle or micro mobility lanes and general carriageways. And we might specify uh, criteria for the types of vehicles that can operate in those different spaces, maximum speeds, maximum dimensions, maximum weights, whether they need lighting, protective gear, et cetera. So that, that means then in terms of the actual design, the materials, et cetera, planners and engineers know what they're designing for. And then if somebody wants to bring a new product to market, if they want it to be accepted, they know it needs to fit one of these performance envelopes. So it's an opportunity, I think, for us to, to be on the front foot. So thank you very much. I'm now going to stop sharing and hand it over to Miha, who's a PhD student um, at UCL, both in my department um, and in the uh, Department of Security and Crime Science. And she's been looking at crime on streets, both existing and also future patterns and what the challenges are like to be in the future. So thank you, over to you, Megan. Thank you, Peter. It was really amazing listening to everybody today morning. I'm just going to share my screen now uh, and the presentation. Um, please let me know if it's visible. Yeah, but not on full screen. It's not on full screen, okay. I think we can see your slides down the left-hand side. 
I don't know why. Let me check. Um, huh. The film show on your. How do I do that? Any idea? Slideshow at the top. Next to animations, there's slideshow at the top. Slideshow. On, on the top, along the top list there, where it says file home, etc. Or there's slideshow. Can you see that? Okay, let me just do it all over again. Okay. I think Gabby is better at advising on this than me. I was going to say, there's, um, if you share your screen again, there's a, there's a, uh, a picture on the presentation mode. If, if you, yeah, but it's, you can plus or minus um, the zooming in on the screen. Okay. Plus or, okay, I think I should be able to zoom in now. Subtitle screen. Hmm. Sorry, can you repeat what exactly do no, I do here? You want, you want to hide the presenter view. To touch on the three points is again. Yeah. Yes. Hide the presenter view. Hide the presenter Thank view. Thank you. Thank you very no. much. We, we, <laughs> Wait, oh, you closed the window again. You stopped sharing. <laughs> what a mess these things, right? That's right. unlucky. Sharing it now. Yes. Thank you. Yes. That's great. Thank you very <laughs> much. That was very, very helpful. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start picking up on this and let's just go to the very first slide quickly. Come on. Yes. Right. So what are we going to talk about today? So I'm going to talk about the digital transformation and definitely about the points already discussed before. I'll make some references to them as we go along. So we are looking at smart streets here. So Basically, what do I mean by smart? It's definitely not a measure of how complex technology is being adopted. It's more about how do we use the technology and the um, I mean the services to create more citizen-centric, helpful modes of transport or helpful place and moment. So we are talking about data-driven. I will I will talk about data-driven services with increased digitization. I will touch upon mainly how it influences the crime landscape and how it challenges the security uh, systems of today. And then we could probably have some case studies based on whatever Peter just discussed. And uh, we could then just, just try and understand how it impacts the urban designs, frankly. So let's start with how are the streets transforming? Uh, as we all know, digital transformation is about using technology and enabled products and services. We have already discussed these four topics. I'm going to pick about the, uh, pick this one. So one earlier, the streets had everything lined up separately, and now we have all these things on the streets talking to each other, connected to each other as well as to the internet. And how does that really change the way we need to design our streets? So I'm just going to start talking about how the um, streetscape is changing. So first of all, um, we have some new elements coming on the streets. We already heard from um, Gabriella and sorry, Gabriella and Jane about the vision of future high streets. I noted down a few things, which uh, was very interesting to me. One was bringing together services, building library of things large town center with lots of assets and joined up planning at operational level. So once I talk about how the streetscape is changing, I'm going to touch upon these four things as well. Um, what we see now is new, say, recycled bins with liquid crystal displays. Uh, we have advertising data collection and digital kiosks for communication. With I mean, people are using digital kiosks on a day-to-day -day basis in some, some of the streets. Um, for finding ways for uh, research, uh, sensing and research points as well, real time. We also see some Amazon collection point lockers where pe things are delivered, kept in the lockers and the smart lockers send out, send out information to the other people saying, yep, yeah, collect these things. Uh, uh, and then we also have some things enhanced. So we have the self-healing roads uh, if there is a bit of a pothole, it automatically sends operational alerts to the um, transport authorities. We see things like real-time monitoring, bike-friendly streets. A lot of things are being enhanced. 
things continuing are lighting columns, greenery, wheelchairs, bollards, and guard railings. Um, of course, street lighting columns are also becoming smarter. They know when to switch on the lights, when to switch off based on the um, lights that uh, light and darkness of uh, during the day. And we have things phasing out. We don't. We are probably not going to see too many phone booths or post boxes going forward because things are very, very different. Now, because of the changing streetscape, definitely people are behaving differently as well. Let's let's first cover the movements and then we come down to the behaviors. Uh, when you look at the um, movement landscape, we see more of e-bikes, which we didn't see 10 years ago in London ever. We see new drones coming up. We see footwear robots. We see some delivery uh, pizzas being delivered by some footwear robots as well. And we see large delivery robots as well. The other things we see is shared mobility options. We, we see the public Wi-Fi in different public places, which allows people to order, say, for example, Uber. Uber was definitely not there about 20 years ago. Uh, we, we have this real-time monitoring and traffic, and we see those uh, kind of uh, detection mechanisms in police cars as well, when, which are roaming around, which helps them understand if there is something uh, some kind of congestion or some kind of help required in certain places. What we also see is along with the smart cars, there are manual side bicycles and uh, mobility scooters and trucks going side by side, which are manually driven and not to the level of um, automation that we see upcoming in a few years. We probably have a bit of phasing out happening sooner or later with more of e-cars coming down, e-vehicles, and less of fossil fuel vehicles, but that's still uh, something that is being transitions. Now, if we look at what's really transforming, well, basically we have sensors, we have data collected, urban data platforms sharing all the data across multiple service providers, and ultimately we see multiple uh, smart products, we see networked sensors giving more data insights, helping people come up with more innovative user-centric connected services. So that's basically what we call a smart here. When we look at how the street elements are being integrated with the digital technology, we see the infrastructure, we see the things, we see the devices, people and places all are connected digitally and all are in the part of the logistics, uh, all become a part of a logistics chain, as well as a predictive and effective operations that are being happening on high, that are happening on residential streets, high streets, highways, so on and so forth. It just allows improved governance, real-time decisions, because all the data, say for example, if you look at the traffic data, we are already probably managing it by understanding that yeah, within two junctions, the traffic is going to be much more. So tell people in advance, either you take a diversion or you bring down, or you are going to be traveling at 40 miles an hour rather than 80. So, so these kind of things are already in there. It helps uh, what Peter mentioned, accessibility, that this transformation helps in affordability. It helps in inclusion. So there's lots of other, uh, lots of advantages there. Now, when we come to the, um, Degrees of digital transformation, I'm just dividing into four simple parts. We have some smart products. We already know things like smart travel cards, smart meters for managing our energy, the smart navigation guides. Well, the interesting part I put here is a smart pacemaker because that's going to be on streets. People are going to be wearing a pacemaker connected to internet or smart health devices, fitness devices, talking to other devices on the streets, including the street infrastructure. We, are, we will be seeing so many sensors on specifically on the smart lamp post. We have seen we are seeing them on already in Westminster area and Greenwich area. Lots of sensors which which connect to probably emergency services or very soon they are already be talking to the sensors on the road, which helps navigate the self driving cars. Uh, there are other urban sharing platforms and EV charging stations, which are something that I'm connect. I mean, I'll be talking about them because they connect to important sectors, transport and energy. When we 
look at these two in Unision, we come up with something called smart services. So we use all the smart infrastructure, the smart transport, the smart products, smart applications, and they together come, uh, use, the, use the urban sharing data for smart traffic management or smart deliveries or smart logistics. And of course, smart homes, which again, will be connected to the things that we see on the street. In the end, we end up with connected places. That's that's the whole purpose of all these connections that you and, and that we have some kind of digital twin cities or multiple cities built on the same kind of a template where everything connects to everything and talks to everyone. Now I'm coming to the next section, which is about crime. So a slight uh, change in topic here because I want to link up the two things in the end. So when we look at the uh, crime and security in UK currently, it's, it's, it's just, I'm just giving you an overview of what are the different street crimes that are being looked at by the Home Office and British Transport Police and City of London and Met Police and so on and so forth. So we have the basic physical crimes, which are, which used to be burglary and pickpocket, which is now more like an online crime where you try and uh, can hack, hack stuff from different people's accounts. There are crimes against society. There are, uh, somebody had mentioned something like terrorism as well. So yes, that's also happening on the streets nowadays where there are bollards and now smart bollards, which are going to give out signals if, if a car is going to be, <laughs> get trying, if a car is getting on the footway or coming nearer to the people, it's just going to start screaming and, Basically, the street infrastructure is going to become so smart that it is going to make sure that the surrounding bollards also rise up, for example, from the ground to stop that kind of a crime happening. Um, there are lots of uh, different drug crimes, for example, autonomous cars can be used for vehicles to distribute drugs. So lots of scope for criminals here and lots of scope for the police as well because they could actually be bringing up things like facial recognition where smart CCTVs across the street can follow a person who has just left a place where a gunshot was detected and they could actually start um, uh, doing the facial recognition, send, uh, send what, I, what should I say, the kind of uh, alerts on different people's mobiles on the, on the street to just make way because there's an emergency vehicle following a person who has just committed a crime. So lot, lots and lots of uh, uh, different things are happening on the streets. Frankly speaking, when we talk about safety, yes, sometimes a lost child can also find a way back home. For example, Finland has introduced some kind of street lighting, which helps uh, children to find their way back or just press a button on these, any lamppost to get some kind of a help. So there's, there's so many different ways, movement, the usage of the street, and, and how people are interacting with their surroundings is going to be changing. The most important thing here is, of course, public opinion and public trust. Say in UK smart highways, the project was halted mainly because people felt that removing the hard shoulder isn't safe for, for them. And although the authorities had evidence that it is safe, owing to public opinion, it was Take, it was halted. So the main thing when all these things are rolled out on the streets is about getting buy-in from the people and make sure people understand how useful it is for them. Like Pedro mentioned, the purpose is the most important thing here. Now let's talk about how all the digital elements coming together on the streets are influencing the crime and the security landscape. I did mention a few examples here. So we now have cars, which actually, when they get into accident, they dial 911, which wasn't happening earlier. I already mentioned facial recognition. There are thermal imaging cameras across to, especially in the pandemic, which alert people. If there is somebody with very high temperature around you, or it could be, uh, which could be actually possibility of a COVID um, contact. There are people who are, um, the, I mean, the criminals are now actually changing their target audience. They are probably, for example, many, many times they shift their attention to the charity because the charity sector is basically very vulnerable. Most of the people are volunteers and there isn't that kind of funding for strict security measures there. So they do target the charity events on the streets. 
there could be people who are actually using um, things like drones, which are being used for spying, for example. There could be uh, new types of crimes happening because the larger attack surface with so many things connected can actually provide real-time information to commit crimes. Some of the crimes are also um, happening because uh, people are just not aware that things, these things are connected and these things could actually create problems for them. Certain types of crimes are continued. Say, for example, uh, you can use crime as a service business model earlier uh, because it doesn't need much of a um, but much of a talent now to, or knowledge, technical know-how to create, say, generate money from a ransomware, because there are freelancers providing a business model for them. And we are, I mean, the normal small crimes are going away, although some physical crimes remain. What's interesting is that the digital and physical crimes and security measures are now coming together uh, and there is there's a lot of overlap between them. Say, for example, there was an infamous uh, Dallas shooting some time ago, and a drone was deployed to just put a bomb there, a small bomb, not a, not a big one, but it rattled the uh, person who was doing the shooting, and it quickly ended a worsening situation. So as Pedro mentioned earlier, traffic and perception of ownership of the street also impacts people's behaviors. Um, and, and so does the fear of connected places. So when all this kind of, uh, it just takes one big crime, like of the Wanna Cry attack, which happened in UK in 2017, which brought down the health services to its knees and it went all the way to the German uh, Deutsche Bahn there. And it was really, really, what, what matters is not just the vision to be, to create a safe and connected and sustainable street. It's also about people feeling safe. It's also about people having trust in the on the streets that this street is definitely secure. So that's that's the vision I'm trying to encourage within the London Office of Technology and Innovation um, processes, which that are talking to lots of other uh, London boroughs as well. Now, just to give an example, earlier if a bike theft was happening, it was completely different. But now we have an alert going to the owner because the locks on the um, bike, if tempered with, it's it's connected to a sensor which sends an alert. The owner calls the police straight away. Owner opens his bike lock app and gives permissions for the police to track the movement. The area video camera closes close to it, just picks it up, CCTV. It sends the images to the security and all their different people in the area. And then officers are able to track from the command and control center. And even before the person leaves the campus, he is just, the bike is recovered. And this, was, this has happened in the California uh, Command College. So now streets, the way streets operate, the way the people are behaving, the criminals are also becoming smarter. So what they would probably do is tamper with the sensor or tamper with the app first before doing something like this, or maybe the CCTV. There are multiple points of failure here, which they could actually look at. So what I look at here is when we talk about a smart street, the key things, whether it's, it's uh, uh, it's a specific type of application on the street or whether it's a movement or its place. What matters is safety, security, privacy, and resilience. Now, resilience you was a word used in one of the presentations, but for me, resilience is about the ability to continue operating despite the disruption. So that's what I mean by resilience. So what are we really building into each of these kind of rollouts on the high streets or on the uh, highways to make sure that if an attack like this happens, if there is a digital disruption on the streets with too much dependency on technology is also harmful, how are we really going to start operating? The key challenges we see is a crowded network, so billions and billions of devices connected. Not everything is secure because 
of lack of knowledge. Sometimes the products come with a one, two, three, four, five password and everybody knows about it. So there are devices which could be tampered with. There are lack of benchmarks. So when we have, say, for example, um, uh, e-scooter or um, even an e-mobility vehicle, micro-mobility vehicle connected to uh, internet, talking to uh, smart lampposts or talking to the emergency systems on, on the streets, we don't even probably know what are the real actual standards that they should be adopting before the rollout to make sure that it is resilient, safe, secure, and the privacy of data is protected. Data, yes, there's a lot out there for data, but I'm not sure how much is out there for security and resilience. Undefined accountabilities and liabilities. So I had done a presentation with a few boroughs like um, the uh, South London Partnership, uh, Greenwich Brent, and many others. And we had talked about what happens if about 150 EV charging stations within the crucial central London area are hacked and there is a ransomware out there. All the, or maybe there is also there is type of a virus which can go into the vehicle battery through an EV's charging station and actually blow up the um, vehicle batteries. So if there are five or 10 cars like that blowing up near the parliament, what exactly happens back there? What is happening there? Of course, emergency services can take over. But who will trace back? What are the digital data that you really need to find out who was accountable? Where do the liabilities lie for the, this kind of uh, scenario? And I think it's a very, they found it very difficult to answer that question. There are always unintended consequences of things which we are rolling out. And we have probably not done enough horizon scanning before we roll out. That was one of the reasons that GLA limited the amount of sensors on the street lights that were being rolled out. There is a lack of single version of truth because data is being maintained by different operators across different cities for the same kind of sensors that are applied. And we don't know which one is the latest data. And that's, that's really causing some kind of a chaos sometimes. So the most important thing is, will people trust all these kind of services on the streets Frankly speaking, finally, they will be calling up the councils and it will be the mayor answering the question, regardless of how much liability is there in the contracts for the third party suppliers. So basically, how does the city maintain trust in the public is a good, good question here. Now, I'm going to pick up some case studies quickly and do a deep dive into this. Sorry, Mayhem, can we just, just a little bit short time, but maybe five minutes if you could, please. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll definitely finish it in five minutes then. So all I have done here is I'm just not going to get into how a CCTV operates. I'm just going to get into there are multiple vulnerabilities within each of these three case studies that I'm picking up. There could be a deep fake. I'll just pick one of them. You can read the rest later. So there is a deep fake tempering with facial features on the CCTV. So even if we are trying to actually use CCTV for safety and security, you may not be able to do it because of the kind of tempering that happens there. Interesting bit was this one. There was a hoax call to police some time ago. I read it in newspaper. People, the, the police actually went there expecting a big um, set of terrorists and organized crime happening there. And all the <laughs> cyber criminals were doing was they were live streaming it and people were paying to watch a live heist. It's just, it is that kind of crime also happens nowadays. EV charging, I already mentioned the kind of uh, attacks that could happen. And these are the various players. Where does the liability really sit when there is, say, for example, thefts of car charging cables or payment solutions which are being hacked or a battery explodes? And this it brings down to critical national infrastructures, transport and energy. Then what exactly happens? The, the crimes are more horrific when it is going across multiple infrastructures. When we talk about the bus stop environment, we are talking about all kinds of things that are connected. Uh, the taxi services, you will be finding lots and lots of information kiosks on the within the bus stops. Uh, on a smart bus stop, I mean, then there were, people could just blink the lights all over the uh, areas of bus stops. We could do it with three lines of code. That's what I was told. One of the programmers told me that. And that itself caused chaos on the street. So how exactly are we going to make sure that we roll out safe, secure bus stops? 
So, so my research is currently ongoing in all these topics. I'm, I'm probably just going to uh, look at how exactly do the amount of smart street, the, the things that we are rolling out on streets, how are we going to make sure that we have checklists before rolling them out, that these things are resilient, secure, and can earn people's trust? How are we going to look at the uh, risks, liabilities around all this? Because there is no standard thing across various cities, that's for sure. People are following different um, lower level aspects, but there is nothing which is consistent across different boroughs of London itself, forget about the rest of the cities of Europe. There's a lack of clarity around how exactly do we recover from these kind of attacks. And frankly speaking, my last um, um, message here is that we should be following a simple thing, and that is if we can't protect it, if we can't keep it trustworthy, then just don't connect it. So that's that's the kind of research I'm looking at, and I hope to come up with outcomes which can provide a framework to address all these questions. Thank you, Peter, and sorry if I've Oh, right. that's that's perfect. I just wanted to make sure we. Um, I think with these online events, the most people thing people most remember is did they finish on time. So I want to make sure we finish on time. Thank you. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, Jane or or Gabby, have you got any reactions or questions you'd like to ask me here about that? I I, I thought it was absolutely fascinating um, and such a lot of information. I suppose. Um, I suppose one of the things that I, I was thinking was that we're doing um, we're doing a, a bit of work with UCL, a different part of UCL, around looking at data and high streets, um, and partly that's because so so much of the data isn't devised for us to understand our high streets or or how people use them. So, you know, someone could get off a tube and then go and do some shopping and then go somewhere else, but we don't know who that person is. Um, and also that data is quite often commercially sensitive, and it's also um, for commercial purposes rather than for public purposes. So I wondered when you were talking about that lack of benchmarks, how would you see that in relation to, to data so that we understand more about how we use our streets? Yeah, thank you, Jane. I think uh, the question is very valid, but uh, you know that GLA has come up with a London data store. So what they are encouraging is that everybody puts their data in the London data store and they have a commons, uh, common database which everybody should be able to access. But that's probably very going to be very difficult when we talk about the data across UK. So, so I don't think there is a solution in place right now. So if you really ask BSI or if you ask NCSC, they are still developing standards around this. So my biggest worry is that we are ruling things out even before the standards are in place, even before the approach is in place. So you, you talked about data. I was actually sitting with them looking at all the different spreadsheets that they have got for procurement of these kind of services, which involve technology, which involve technology-based infrastructure. And everybody has got a different checklist of what they are going to ask suppliers to provide them. So if you are going to have different checklists for safeties, and there are sometimes around 150 questions for the suppliers, they don't really understand. They don't really understand how to respond to those 50, 150 questions. And finally, people run out of time and they just accept it because there is no time left to understand whether the answers are consistent and whether the answers mean whether they are secure or insecure because there's a lack of benchmark. So it's not just a problem that councils are facing, it's a problem that NCSC needs to help you with. They are trying their best. They are rolling out different guidelines. They are rolling out different kinds of, um, if you look at uh, the connected places guidelines, they have got a set of uh, around 200 pages. But what London Office of Technology and Innovation was struggling with was the amount of guidance and standards that you have got out there it's about 500 pages worth it's mind boggling councils don't have time for that so maybe you, we could have another session after this whenever you have time and we could actually narrow it down or you could talk to peter and how do we really narrow it down to the most important questions so most so what is it say about 50 things that we could look at or 10 things we could look at top 10 things that could actually solve 90 percent of the problems so that's that's a challenge okay Thanks very much. Um, Pedro, would you like to give 90 seconds of reflections? And it's a challenge, 90 seconds, but. <laughs> well, 
I was going to ask um, uh, Meha to um, explain in more detail how you can get the police to storm your neighbor's house. Sounds like a very, it's, the future is full of opportunities, huh? <laughs> no, uh, it, it's, it's really interesting how uh, all these new threats, technology does bring opportunity um, for, for crime, for new forms of crime as well. And um, I'm, I'm actually flabbergasted. I have no questions. <laughs> I'm just surprised. I was a really good presentation. Thanks a lot. That's quite an achievement, Miha, to uh, make Pedro speechless. I, I think that uh, you score top marks on that. Okay. Well, thank well, you. Uh, sorry, just I would like to add, if anybody has more questions or wants to understand more details, feel free to contact Peter or me one on one, and we will be able to send it. I mean, have a separate session on this. Thank you. Yeah, and on the slide, your last slide has got your email address, hasn't it? And, and mine's got mine. Okay, well, I, I think time to draw it to a close. Just like to thank our speakers, Gabby and Jane and, and Pedro and Miha very much for their presentations. Thank you very much for those who've been online listening to this. Thank you to Francesco and colleagues for uh, make the thing run so smoothly. And um, I hope you've all found it useful. Please feel free to follow up and uh, hope the rest of your day goes well. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.